it's the info. It's the man with the info. Whatever you want to know, come join the man with the info show. It's the info. It's the man with the info. Whatever you want to know, come join the man with the info show. It's the info. It's the info. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Hi, everybody out there. This is Information Man. This is my channel. Thank you for coming over and checking out what I've got going on here. As you can see by the description in this video, I'm going to be talking about the issues around mass incarceration. And what does it mean? How is it impacting our society? How is it impacting us as black people? If such a thing exists. Now, I'm going to go through a series of information, data. I have some pie charts that I'll be putting up on the screen. For those of you that will be listening in my podcasting network, you can go over to the YouTube channel, Information Man Show, and support me over there if you like to get more details in terms of the pie charts and the various statistical charts that I'll have on the screen for this presentation. So, with that said... Let me get right into it. Mass incarceration. Can it really be true? Okay, folks. That most people in jail, a lot of people don't realize this. Most people that are in jails are being held before they ever make it to trial. How much of mass incarceration is a result of war on drugs. And remember the war on drugs when Ronald Reagan was president back in the 80s and there was this whole campaign about just say no to drugs. So it's been uh, it's been proven. It's been looked at about how the war on drugs, the whole issue around drugs fuse uh, not only violence in the communities, uh, but it also fuse this um, situation in which you have people going to prison. It's fueling the prison industrial complex system. Now, this is a question that we must ponder for ourselves. We must try to figure out, analyze. The questions are hardly, they're hard to answer. Then most of us may really give credit to it. But the reality is because our country or this country we call America has a system of confinement. Okay. And confinement going all the way back to slavery as black men came out of slavery and black women came out of slavery into reconstruction, you had the slave patrols, which is how police officers in the first place, police forces got created. They had to find a new way to keep black people oppressed and the prison system became a lucrative and profitable connection from slavery back into slavery under the system of incarceration the jail system was set up in this country particularly to control and keep focus on black men in particular because there was a concern that black men were going to destroy this society that we were going to savage after their women so that's some a small summary but there's more to how this whole situation around incarceration um plays its role in this society it was always about focusing on controlling black people so let's just look at this confinement okay because we live in a country because this country that we live in has always been about confinement confinement okay and so it's a fragile it's a fragile situation various government agencies involved in the I would call the injustice system, but it's the justice system, as some would call it. Have collected data around this issue of mass incarceration, but it is not designed to help policymakers or public understanding un to make the public understand exactly what's going on. So let me break that down again. There is various government agencies involved in the justice system collecting a lot of critical data or data, but it is not designed to help policymakers 
or the public understand what's going on. Now, meaningful criminal justice reform that reduces the mass scale of incarceration will require that we or this country starts with the big picture. What is the big picture? Got to look at the big picture. And that big picture is the need of understanding and piecing together the disparity in this country we call America, the system of confinement. The report that I'm going to offer you will talk about much needed clarity to understanding confinement in American society as it relates to incarceration. America's criminal justice system holds almost 2.3 million people in 1,719 state prisons. You got 102 federal prisons. You got 1,852 juvenile correctional facilities in this country. You got 3,163 local jails and 80 Indian country jails as well as in military prisons. You got immigration detention facilities, civil com commitments centers, state psychiatric hospitals and prisons in the United States. Now, I happen to work in a medical prison in the state of California. So I see it firsthand. I deal with uh, guys in the prison system of all different backgrounds, gangs, economic and social backgrounds. And I see it firsthand that in, in America, particularly in California too, that the prison system is becoming a de facto mental health system for what the counties and the cities either are not able to do, can't do, don't want to do because they're so squeezed and there's so much demand for mental health that what happens is sometimes judges will send. And this is just the truth. Judges will send guys who should be in traditional mental health hospitals to prison because they know that the prisons are mandated to provide mental health these days. So it's becoming quite a problem in the prison system, even today. So let me go into this presentation further. So as I said, you've got psychiatric hospitals and prisons in the United States territories. And this is very important. We go now. I want to go deeper with this. With this report, I want to provide further details to everybody listening. I'm going to go into further details on why people are locked up in all of those different types of facilities that I just named military prisons, okay, immigration detention facilities, juvenile correctional facilities, 80 Indian country jails, okay. We got 100 and 102 federal prisons, 1,719 state prisons, as I in stated before, and the juvenile facilities are at 1,852 juvenile correctional facilities, okay? So what we want to do here is let me uh, look at, check out this, this first chart here that I have up. It states here, the federal system of corrections involved in multiple agencies and thousands of facilities across the country. So on this uh, chart, you'll see where it says the Bureau of Prisons in United States Marshal Services, 225,000. The Bureau of Prison convicted is 174,000. You got Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which we call ICE, 34,000. Prison Policy. OK, now we have the U.S. Marshal Service detention people held per trial for federal office. OK, serving short terms, federal sentences for transport to federal prison counts, confines in people, Bureau of Prison operates detention centers, multiple correctional centers, centers 
and federal transfer centers, 15 contracted private prisons. We got 15 contracted private prisons. We got 1,800 contracted states and local facilities around the country. Most local jails. Okay. Then we have Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which I said ICE again. The detention, deten detaining people for violations of immigration laws in private contracted prisons. So we have private contracted prisons for that. We have contracted local facility jails and federal detention centers again. So this is what this chart is all about here. I'm going to say it again. The federal system of incarceration involves multiple agencies and thousands of facilities across this country that we live in right here in America cannot be denied whatsoever. So let me go for, I'm going to go further with this information as we go on with the presentation. Now, the bigger, let me look at this now. Let's, let me just break this down. The bigger picture view allows us to focus on let me see it will allow us to focus on the most important drivers of mass incarceration and identify important but often ignored, ignored systems or basically it often we don't realize or we're ignorant to or we don't understand that the system of confinement the detailed views bring these overall look parts of the pie. And the pie is, let me bring up another slide here. Boom. The most confined youth are locked up for nonviolent offenses. So I'm bringing this up. You see another slide here. And the for almost 10,900 youth, they are locked up for offenses that aren't even criminals. So we have youth in America are confined at a rate of 53,000. Juvenile justice system is at 48,000. Adult justice systems are at 5,000. The status is 2,300. 2, Technical violations at 8,600. Public orders. So you can see on this uh, chart, uh, youth, when youth are arrested, are handled in this country uh, we've got weapons drugs and other drugs and other property crimes auto theft theft in general uh, this is what this chart is basically showing right here and for almost 10,900 youth they are locked up for offenses that are not even criminal or crimes let me just say that crimes okay true real crimes and so America has a thirst for locking us up because there's a profit in locking people up. Remember, people are a spendable and the dollar is recoverable in American society. Let me uh, continue on as I will go from slide to slide. Um, I just had to bring up the issue around youth because I don't think we often focus on incarceration as it relates to men and sometimes women. But we forget that a lot of this pattern of being incarcerated in this country starts at the very youth, at the very young. And it's been proven, it's been analyzed that if you have poor schools, poor communities, uh, poor infrastructure, and you do not get a proper education, uh, in some cases in some of our urban or lower socially economic areas of this country, that it does translate to higher counts of you going to be incarcerated possible even though it's based on personal choices that you make but there are environmental factors societal factors that can play in play a role into one being in a situation in which they're they are incarcerated i know this very well because i work in the prison system most of the guys i deal with they have a record going back to their youth i've also had the experience of working with children in programs children that were emotionally disturbed who were already starting to get records going in and out of juvenile. They were already being uh, treated as if they are criminals already and what have you. So it's, this starts very young from the juvenile system as you graduate from that system to, the, to, to a man's prison. And I have also dealt with young men who were 17 and 16 years old and were given a, a adult sentence 
to be sent to a man's prison. So this is uh, very serious stuff. Now, let me go on and say that civil commitment to youth confinement. And I talked about I talked about youth. OK, there's a civil commitment and a youth confinement in particularly local jails often receive short shifts and large discussions about criminal justice. But they play a critical critical role as incarceration's front door and have a far greater impact than the daily numbers suggest. While you see in, in the chart that I had put up, the pie chart provided, this pie chart provided a comprehensive snapshot shot. So once again, the pie chart that I have up gives a comprehensive snapshot of our correctional system. The graphics do not does not capture the enormous outlook in our in our correctional facility, the enormous number and how massive the correctional system is in America and how it impacts our citizens, our citizens here in this country. OK, now correctional facilities and the far largest universe of people whose lives are affected by the criminal justice system. Every year, 626,000 people walk out of prison gates, but people go to jail at a rate of 10.6 million times each year. So even though they're getting out, they're going right back in. It's like an evolving door. And I know from an article that I read in New York Times a few years ago in Los Angeles, every time they release guys out of prison in California, they will automatically do these sweeps and they will put guys back into prison. So they have gang members, people who work as CIs, who are spies, that they know are out there doing stuff that's not right. And as new guys come on the street, they arrest those guys, bring them to prison. And then as the new guys come out who are, who are on parole, they will put pressure on some of these guys, especially if they're gang connected, to work as CIs. And it just keeps flipping itself. Some, as some come in, some go out, and as some go out, and those that come in, go back out, they arrest those on the street, bring them back in because the cycle must uh, continue itself because they used to say that crime doesn't pay. Yes, it does. Crime pays the judge. It pays the lawyer. It pays the correctional officer. It pays everyone who is involved in the system and working in the system myself in mental health. Unfortunately, and the truth of the matter is I'm also getting paid as well in the capacity of the work that I'm doing because crime does pay it does pay a system and it's a bit uh, uh in, in prisons state prisons federal prisons in american society is a lucrative proposition whether good or bad it's a lucrative proposition so as i said six hundred and twenty six thousand people walk out of prison gates but people go to jail at a rate of 10 Point six million times each year. Jail particularly is a high is high and jails particularly is very high because most people in jail have not been convicted. So you could be uh, arrested, as you know, and put in jail and you can find yourself sitting in jail for a quite a long time. Before you're even able to see a judge. I see this firsthand. I have guys at where I work at who go out to court because they have other cases that are coming down the pipeline on them. And I may not see them for weeks or even months before they're brought right back to the facility because they're being held in a jail when they're transferred, waiting to talk to a judge. And it can take up to weeks in some cases, very long periods of time because the the justice system or the injustice system in American society is very uh, backed up. It's a very backed up system. Uh, and, 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 and this is just a reality that we need to um, understand that the, there's so many variables that go on in the criminal justice system. So as I said, they're sitting there and they have not been convicted. Some have just been arrested and will make bail in the next few hours or days and others are too poor to make bail 
And if you are too poor to make bail, you're going to sit in there for a long time. And as I was reading off of the pie chart, as it relates to juvenile youth, a lot of them are being arrested for doing really no real crimes. And they're sitting in detention centers awaiting their trial or waiting some sort of justice or, you know, it's really crazy, folks. So you can just be arrested. If you got the money, you can get out. If you don't have the money, if you have money, you can you can work within the system. If you got no money, you can't. If you look in the case of O.J. Simpson, whether you believe he was guilty or not, O.J. was able to benefit because he had the money to get the best lawyers to circumventilate the system, which allowed him to be able to um, win the trial in the case of the situation that happened many years ago with O.J. So I just wanted to bring that up. That's very, very, very important. So check this out. So, like I said, others are too poor. If you are too poor to make bail and must remain behind bars until the trial, that happens. Only a small number at around 150,000 on any given day have been convicted, generally serving a misdemeanor sentence under a year. Let me repeat that again. Only... 150,000 excuse me folks only 150,000 on any given day have been convicted generally serving a misdemeanor sentence under a year it's outrageous just outrageous now this is a chart right here I'm putting up as you can see Pre-trial detention. Local, 465,000. The United States has more people at 536,000 detained before trial than most countries have in their prison and jail combined. Listen to this. Listen to this, folks. So in America, you can have 536,000 Americans Detained in, in, a, in a jail awaiting their trial more than most countries have in their prison or in their jails. Just being held. You haven't been formally charged with anything. Of course, you've got these police officers out here that will say you have the right to remain silent. Anything can be used against you in a court of law. If you want a, 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 a counsel or a judge, one can be appointed to you if you don't have the money or means to get a lawyer. And you could be sitting in there for a long time. He or she who has the money gets the justice and he or she who has no money gets nothing. Nothing from nothing leaves you nothing. OK, now with youth on this chart, it talks about youth. This is all in small print. So definitely take a look at this, folks. Look at this video over and over again. Really study it. This is very important information. Because, as you know, information is power. Information is power. Youth at nine thousand psychiatric evaluations or treatment of 9,000 Indian County Indian County jails are at about one almost 1100 okay federal 51,000 so no Indian country is at 1,100 in federal prisons you can be up at 51,000 so this is based on pre-trial detention okay pre-trial detention detention you haven't been charged with anything you're just setting waiting vegetating waiting for so-called justice that's what this chart is showing you right here this is crazy let me um let me get back there's a there's a chart that i should have displayed a little bit earlier, but I'm going to bring it up now and get back to this area that I was just talking about. This chart right here. This is a chart that I should have put up earlier in the presentation, but here it is, folks. How many people 
are locked up in the United States. So this is a chart that kind of breaks it down. The United States locks up more people per capita than any other nation. But grip, but grippling with why it requires us to first consider many types of incarceration facilities and the reason that 2.3 million people are com com confined there. So state prisons were locking up woo, about 1.316,000. So we're looking at millions of people. Local jails are at 615,000. Federal prisons and jails were locking up to a tune of 225,000. Youth facilities at 48,000. And overall state prisons are damn near at 1.316,000. 1 so we're looking at a million 316,000. We're locking up some serious folks. We're locking up some. We're locking folks up seriously, uh, putting people in jail. And around this pie chart, if you take a look at it, uh, it's letting you know what they're being arrested for. You've got murder, 180,000 people being arrested for murder. Manslaughter at 18,000. Drug offenses at 1,000. Drugs in general at 35,000. Violence at 32,000. Okay. Public order, disorder at 1,000. And this chart, the way it has it set up is that it has based on state prison on one on side, one side of it called state prison. It's showing you what people are in there for uh, when it comes to youth. The majority of youth that are in there is for like public order, meaning youth that are being getting out of control. So you're at forty six thousand of federal prisons let me say the immigrant you got immigration 13,000 people incarcerated in federal prison because of immigration laws violence 13,000 property 11,000 drug offenses in federal prisons and 82,000 that means that's the number of people that are being arrested and going into federal prisons overall state prisons it's a little bit of everything drug possession burglary theft at 48,000 burglary at 128,000 drug possession at 45,000 and other drugs at 155,000 you've got driving under the influence of alcohol at 26,000 other public uh, order at 75,000 weapons at a thousand assault is at 138,000 robbery at 175,000 rape and sexual assault at 164,000 that comprises why you have this large number of people in this pie chart, as you can see, a majority of people that are in state prisons. Local jails at 115,000 is due to property, uh, drugs, and public order as well. 118,000, 116,000 for property, 118,000 for drug, and it goes on and on and on and on. Uh, and on the other side of the pie chart, it says here, Indian country, uh, we have at 2.500. Then you got military prisons at 1.300. Involuntary commitment. That's involuntary commitment to these institutions. Immigration detention center. ICE has about 34,000. Public order. So this pie chart, check it out. Look at it. Study it. Look at this video again. And uh, look at the pie charts that I'm putting up and how it fits, how it's a part of um, where I'm going with this. Let me um, continue to, I'm going to go back to a few more slides uh, in this presentation right here. So let me see right here. Let me go right over. I'm going to go back up to another chart that I think I need to display because I think this is very important. So here's another chart, folks. Take Check that out. This is local jails hold one out of every three incarcerated people so you can see here in jail 731,000 it has it broken down as I was reading earlier by violence property drugs public order violence property drugs it's breaking it down based on what people are being held for and uh, it goes into uh, uh, convictions public order so everything is on this chart as you can see take a look at that chart as um, I have it displayed. And once again, everybody, this is Information Man. I hope uh, you're getting something out of the presentation so far. You're 
And so I'm keeping that chart up for everybody to take a look at it. And remember, you can always look at this video as many times as you like to let it all soak itself in. But that's a chart right there that I want everybody to take a look at as it relates to uh, local jails hold one out of every three incarcerated people. Okay, here's another chart right here that I want to get into. Most confined youth are locked up. So as I was saying earlier in my presentation, I believe that this is where mass incarceration or incarceration um, begins. It's, it gets its start. It gets its start at the youth level. Because you have youth, excuse me, who are being inundated with the criminal justice system at an early age. As the chart says here, most confined youth are locked up for non-violent offenses. And for almost 10.900 youth, they are locked up for offenses that aren't even crimes. So I had to go back to that chart again because I want to drive home the point that this is where it starts. Once they criminalize our children and get our children in the system, it makes it easier for them to push the narrative on you as you become an adult. Once you get a record early on, it's hard for you to get employment. It's hard for you to get into school. Hard for you to change your life when they put an early stigma on you. And historically, this is something that they have done to African-American people, particularly uh, our black males. So let me go to another chart here and let you see something else here. Now, this is the one. Remember I said that a lot of uh, prisons now are becoming de facto mental health facilities and a lot of judges are pushing uh, guys that are in the community into mental health facilities. And in some cases, they're throwing guys into facilities in prison that should be in mental health, traditional mental health hospitals. But uh, when you are behaving in such a way in conservative communities, you, it depends on the kind of community that you live in. If you're in a liberal community, when you when you have mental health problems, and let's say you got like guys that go into a 7-Eleven and they bust a bottle or the store clerk is saying, get out of my store. I have seen cases where guys have come into prison who should have been in a traditional mental health facility, get sent to prison where they can be victimized that should have never been sent to a prison because their crime was not necessary violence towards another person. But they're using the prison system flooding us with guys who have serious mental health problems that we are now being charged with the responsibility of taking care of, providing treatment and protection because they come into prison and they can be victimized. So psychiatric facilities, as you can see on this chart, facilities can find 22,000 people. The justice involves people every day. And under discussion discussed parts of justice system is the involuntary commitment involuntary commitment and detention of justice involved people in state psychiatric hospitals and other facilities so these people are being put in these facilities involuntarily they didn't volunteer for it they didn't want it where i work at in california we have something called a pc 2602 if we deem someone to be a danger to themselves, a danger to others, they're gravely ill, we can, uh, the doctors can file a petition to take them to court. We have courts within the prison system where um, the inmate or the patient inmate will be sent to court. He is given a, a, he's given a lawyer. A lawyer will represent him, will talk to him, and the doctor will lay out their findings for why inmate patient or inmate should be under a what we call a PC 2602 under the title 15 penal code of California because we see him as a danger to himself and others and he needs to have medications administered. These sort of things do go on and there's a large body of people, as you can see, 22,000 um, that are in our, that are in psychiatric facilities, but there are psychiatric facilities in the prison system, particularly here in California where I work. So you can see on there, the justice system, the numbers are there. You've got the not guilty by reason of insanity. We do have that in California. I think it's a 1026 code where a guy can be seen as uh, not fit to stand trial. He's not competent to stand trial. That does happen. And you've got about 6,400 people 
in this country that fit that criteria. You got post-release commitment in detention at 6,300 commitment. And you got incompleted to un incompetent, as I said before, excuse me, incompetent to stand trial or pre-trial evaluation or treatment at 9,100. So that's these are the numbers of people in American society uh, every day in our prison systems. This is the pie chart that breaks that down. So make sure you take a good look at this pie chart. Understand um, where I'm going with this presentation and what I'm trying to, to lay out, everybody. I think everybody out there who is supporting the program, it's much appreciated. We got to tell the truth. Tell the truth. And so let me continue with the rest of this presentation. Now, here we got another slide. I had to bring this up. We've got the federal system of incarceration involving multiple agencies and thousands of facilities across the country. Now, I talked about that earlier. And uh, like I said, you have the Bureau of Prison and U.S. Marshal Services. 225,000 people are incarcerated in that. Bureau of, Pri of Prisons convicted 174,000. And you got so it's all laid out here. You got the immigration and customs enforcement at 34,000. As I mentioned before, but here is a pie chart or, or at least a pie chart. Some illustrations on here to let you uh, take a look at that. So take a look at that. That's very important aspect of the presentation. I want everybody to take a look at that real good here. And then uh, let me move on to uh, other areas of the presentation. Now, I remember I, before I came, went back and switched uh, gears in this presentation, I talked about pretrial detention. And let me bring up another chart for you all to see this. Now, here's another chart. Pretrial police, uh, uh, pretrial policies drive jail growth. Check out this um, chart right here. The number of people in local jails by conviction status from 1983 to 2016. Pre-trial detention is responsible for all net jail growth in the last 20 years. Look at this. Look at the chart. It's going up to 500,000, none convicted. And then you've got convicted at 250,000. And then down here you have the years from 1983 all the way to 2016. The complete form, the Bureau of Justice Status ser Series, prison and justice inmates, the conviction population in the United States, and the jail inmates, missing data for 1994. Hmm. So check out that slide that you see right there. This is a very important information is definitely power. Let me go to another slide for folks to look at. Now you have local jails. The real scandal is the is the local jail system. OK, what does ten thousand six million jail Again, emissions look what like? What does ten thousand point six million jail emissions look like? Well, when talking about the society impact of jails, the average daily population of 650,000 is far less important than the <clears throat> staggering numbers. 10.6 million admitted to jail each year. So that's where that where I figure I said 10.6 million jail emissions look like a year. People are being bussed into these facilities. It's not enough that people, it's not enough for people to fill a line of prison buses bumping bumper to bumper from New York City to San Francisco. So that's enough, that, that's interesting. So that's enough buses with people on it that can go from New York all the way across the country to San Francisco, bumper to bumper. Very interesting. Now, this is another pie chart here, folks, that I just put up. 
And I want you to take a look at this. Local jails hold one out of every three incarcerated people in America. 731,000. So here's the pie chart on that. Check that out. Study that. Get familiar with it. Now, this is all about getting a sense of the big picture, okay? This is to understand uh, because people are going to have questions. Well, why is it that this is happening? Why does so many people, well, let's say, let's look at it like this. Many people are locked up for drug offenses. We know that almost half of a million people are locked up because of a drug offense. The data confirms that nonviolent drug convictions are a defining characteristic of the federal prison system that's why i was saying these charts that i put up i want you to take a a good look at them okay so defining the characteristics of the federal prison system but it only plays only to support it only plays a supporting role everybody and that supporting role is the states the local level while most people in states and local facilities are not locked up for drug offenses, most states continue practices of arresting people for drug possession, destabilizing individual lives and communities. Drug arrests give residents of over-policed communities, and don't we have some over-policed communities Black folks out there, everybody listening, communities, criminal records. So if you over police a community, you're going to have police records. Remember Ferguson? You saw in Ferguson was a perfect example of this and where you had large numbers of black people lived, but they didn't control the local government. And you had a disproportionate amount of black people that were getting traffic tickets that were being harassed by the police in Ferguson and what have you. And that it was clearly uh, from the data that of black people were not in control of their own community from a political uh, level, okay? And so when you put people, the mayonnaise people in charge of things that are in a position to oppress you, um, then you're going to have what? Higher policing translate for some people in this society criminal records. Now, when you have a criminal record, folks, what is it ends up? When is it? What does it end up relating to? A reduction, reducing employment prospects. So if you got criminal record, you've got all this on you on your record. It's going to affect your ability to retain employment. It reduces your opportunity for employment prospects and it increases the likelihood of long prison sentences for any for any future offenses so the more you get stuff on your record and other things come up and i've seen this with guys who got long sentences for doing some some things that you can consider was sort of minor but we always look at their records and we look at what was their other commitments what other crimes that they have over the years and sometimes when you, especially in conservative communities, if the judge gets tired of seeing your face, they may throw the book at you. So the more uh, offenses you have on your record, the more chances it increases your uh, chances of doing longer and longer prison terms. Now, here's a chart I want everyone to look at. This is very important right here. One in five incarcerated people is locked up for a drug offense. 456,000 are held for possession of trafficking or other non-violent drug offenses. I've been saying this. I've said it on O'Shea's channel on Sunday uh, Rumbles. I've gotten into it with ABL about this. Um, most black, uh, most people that are incarcerated are there for nonviolent offenses. And, but more so, uh, I see here in California that a lot of black men who are incarcerated are in prison because of drug 
uh, possession, smear, uh, selling marijuana, cocaine, or they might have been on parole and they had scounded from their parole, meaning they didn't uh, report to the parole officer, they didn't get a job, they didn't do some things that they were supposed to do. But it wasn't necessary because they went out and they were killing people that we have some pathology to killing people using firearms and such like that. State prisons overall will hold people uh, who have none drug who have who have none violent offenses just for drugs at the level of two thousand two hundred and two uh, two hundred thousand. OK, local jails will hold people at one hundred and eighteen thousand unconvicted. Thirty five thousand may be convicted in local jails. In the federal uh, jurisdictions of prisons, you got 82,000 under the Bureau of Prisons that have been uh, uh, placed in there over drug issues. Now, federal prisons tend to put people in jail who violate RICO Act laws, people that are uh, moving and shaking, uh, moving uh, drugs at high levels. When you get that federal um, uh, time put on you, 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 it's usually for people that are moving heavy weight, as they would say, in some cases. Then you've got youth at 2,600 2, and military at 90. This is around the issues of one in five incarcerated people is locked up for a drug offense. Those are the numbers across the board in the different types of prison environments that are locked up in this country for drug offenses. It's very important. Let me... Go over to the next slide here. Drug offenses and pretrial detentions are defining characteristics of the federal system. Federal 225,000, as I said before. Look at that slide. Take a look at it. As I get ready to go into the next slide. So take a look at that. And now here we go at another slide here. There are over 1 million drug possession arrests each year. There are more than six times as many arrests for drug possession as for drug sales in millions since 1980 all the way up to 2015. So look at that chart. As you can see from 1980 all the way to 2015, but it has 14 down here. This is a compare. This is by the prison policy initiative from Federal Bureau of Investigation. This is FBI material here crime in the united states and this is the chart here take a look at that once again there are more than six times as many arrests for drug possessions as for drug sales in the millions okay so people who just have possession who may be using it for their personal use they're being arrested at a higher count than even people who sell the drugs according to this data that i have here and you can see on the pie chart so look at that very very closely. Okay, next. Some states have larger, largely ended the war on drugs. Other states are not so much. We got New York and Oklahoma. You see New York is not, doesn't look like New York is doing well. Drug offenders as shared, shared of New York. Prison population from 1992, 2015. Then you have the drug offenders as shared by Oklahoma prison population from 1992. If you notice, let me correct myself. If you notice, um, I think New York is spiking downward because New York really has a lot of heavy laws. So let me correct myself. And you can see Oklahoma is spiking upward, as you can see on the chart. So Oklahoma is spiking upwards where New York is spiking downwards. Some states have larger, has largely ended the war on drugs. Other states are not so much. Oklahoma spiking up. New York, state of New York is spiking downward, if I'm reading this chart correct. Compelled by the prison, this is put together by the, once again, by the Prison Policy Initiative from State Prison Records for the years 1992 to 2015. So I think I think that that I, th I thought that was very fascinating. Now, the criminal justice system involves some complicated decisions and relationships, some but not all of which can be represented 
and geographically. For example, it is easy to show how jails rent space to states and federal agencies and that 5,000 youth are actually in adult facilities. I said this before in the prison system where I work at in California, I do see young men that are 16, 17 years old that have been giving an adult sentence and they're in adult prisons. And that does that said right there, they're renting space in federal agencies, local agencies, actually in adult facilities. The offense data oversimplifies how many people interact with the criminal justice system. So there's a very large, it's, I think it's very, it's, it's, this is very telling. A person in prison for multiple offenses is reported only for the most serious offense. So, for example, there are people in prison, folks, for violent offenses who might have also been convicted of drug offenses. Further, almost all convictions are a result of what? Plea bargains. Oh, yeah. Plea bargains happen quite a bit where people plead guilty to lesser offenses, perhaps of the different category or one that they may not have actual committed. So sometimes you see it all the time. Judges, lawyers will will uh, manipulate guys to take convictions that they didn't even commit so that they can get a lesser prison term. Uh, sometimes guys are manipulated into doing this because they don't have proper representation. And when you have a public offender, you're not going to get the same type of top notch uh, <laughs> legal uh, support to you like an O.J. Simpson when he had with Johnny Crocker. You're not going to get that. You're not going to get the you're not going to get a superior. You're not going to get any of these top flight lawyers. You're going to get the bottom of the barrel lawyers in some cases who are pushing you to push these plea deals or take these damn plea deals. OK, so where let me, so let me go. Let me go on with the presentation. People plead guilty to lesser offenses, perhaps of different categories, one that they may not have actually committed. That's very important. OK, and many of these categories Groups together, people convicted of a wide range of offenses. For example, murder is generally considered to be a extreme serious offense. But murder groups together, the rare group of serial killers with people who commit acts that are unlikely for reasons of circumstances or advanced age to ever happen again. It also includes offenses that the average American may not consider to be murder at all. For example, the felon, the felon murder rule says that if someone dies during the commission of a felony, everyone involved can be as guilty as murder as the person who pulled the trigger driving a getaway car. So like you back in the day when you used to have drive by shootings, particularly in, in the Los Angeles area in California, if you're in a car with your, with your homeboy or your friend or someone and they shoot someone in a drive-by and you knowingly are in the car, even though you didn't pull the trigger, they will say that you're, you're going to get murder on your record. They're going to treat you just as if you had pulled the trigger yourself. Driving a getaway car during a bank robbery where someone was accidentally killed is indeed a serious offense. But many may be surprised that this is considered a murder. So you robbing a bank, someone gets murdered. I've seen a guy like that too, where he was a, he was a getaway guy and they gave him the conviction of murder as well. Plus he had priors. Now, let's break this down some more. Breaking down incarceration by offense types also exposes some disparities, fact, disparating facts about the youth confined by our criminal justice or injustice system. Too many of, 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 our, of, their, of our youth, too many of them mostly serious offenses that is not even a crime. For example, there are over... 8,500 youth behind bars for technical 
violations of the requirement of their probation rather than for a new offense. Further, 2.3 youth are locked up for stats offenses which are behaviors that are not law violations for adults such as running away trespassing in okay uh, youth that have you know gotten themselves out there with vandalism and um, you know creating uh, disturbances in communities encourageable type of uh, behavior nearly one in ten is held in a adult jail or prison this is our youth i'll say it again nearly one in ten youth are held in an adult jail or prison and most of the others are held in juvenile facilities that looks and operates a lot like prisons and jails Now, turning to people who are locked up criminally, criminally and civilly for immigration related issues, we find that 13,000 people in federal prisons for criminal convictions are violating federal immigration laws and 13,000 more are held in pretrial by the United States Marshals Department. Another 35,000 are civilly detained by the United States Immigration and Customs Enforcement we call ICE. Separated from and criminal proceeding and are physically confined in federal run or privately run immigration detention facilities or in local jails under contract with ICE. Notably, these categories do not include immigration represented in other pie slice charts. So when you have a chart that breaks that down, they're saying it's not represented in any type of data properly because none immigration related criminal convictions adding to the universe of people who are confined because of justice system and involvement involves 22,000 people are involuntarily detained or committed to states, psychiatric hospitals, and civil committed centers. I said this before. Many of these people are not even convicted and some are held indefinitely. 9,000 are being evaluated pre-trial or treated for incompetency, as I spoke up before. To stand trial at 6,000 have been found not guilty by reason of insanity. Excuse me, folks. But mentally or mentally ill. Another 6,000 are people convicted of sexual crimes who are uh, who are involuntarily committed after their prison sentence are completed. While their facility while these facilities aren't typically run by departments of corrections, they are in reality much like prisons. Now, I've seen guys where I work at who committed a federal offense while they're finishing up their state prison term and they parole from state prison. The feds will pick them up right after they finish their state term and take their butts right to a federal prison. This happens. I've seen situations where guys who come from across the border like Mexico who committed crimes in America like rape. They are serving a prison term. Um, or state term and our tax dollars are paying for their housing and every damn thing else and then after they do their prison term in in the state then they are they are they are detained and sent back to mexico for example after they have finished their time in american prisons now various systems of confinement in the United States justice system available, these snap these snapshots that I've just talked about, folks, cannot capture all the important systems, cannot capture everything systematically in these issues. But once we have, you know, gotten our minds wrapped around these issues of how mass incarceration, for example, uh, works in America. We should zoom 
take notes, understand, and take note of the fact that being locked up is just one piece of the large pie of correctional control. There are another there there are another eight hundred and forty thousand people on parole and a staggering three point seven million people on probation, as I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, particularly given often numerous conditions of probation. So oftentimes they're on probation when this is happening. Policymakers should be cautious when it comes to incarceration that can easily widen the net of criminal criminalization to people who are not threats to public safety. So I, and I can attest to this. There are people that are in prison who are not in prison because they did any harm to anybody. Some cases they they're in prison because they were selling drugs. Well, they were, well, they had drug possession. They were harming themselves. They were going to use drugs for themselves. They have drug habits. A lot of the guys that I deal with, when we talk to them, when I talk to them, they have a long drug use history. They're abusing themselves on drugs. Okay. Not to say that there's not people out there who use drugs who also become a liability to the community because when people are hooked on drugs, they have to uh, feed their drug habits so that they will do, they will do things like panhandle. They will do things like robbery, burglary, all those sort of things. I, I, I definitely realize that those are factors that we cannot um, keep out of the equation here. Okay. But is this is saying that there are people that are incarcerated that are being held and confined that are not threats to public safety that are in prison under these terms. Now, let's identify some other parts of this criminal justice system that that is also impacting the most most people. We should also focus on who is most impacted uh, and who is left behind by policy changes. For example, people of color. Now, black people, we are definitely affected by this. Like I said earlier, this whole prison system police system comes out of slavery out of slave patrols out of reconstruction when they were trying to keep tabs and control uh black men in particular black people in particular but we have to understand that most of the people that are impacted by these policies are people of color or people black people in particular or people who happen to be melanated that are being impacted by the criminal justice system okay people of color are dramatically overly represented in the nation's prisons and jails. <clears throat> These racial disparities are, part, are particularly because blacks who make up 40%, now black people make up 40% of the incarcerated population despite representing only 13% of the United States residency, okay? Gender disparity ma matters too, okay? Rates of incarceration have grown even faster for women than for men in the United States of America. As policymakers continue to push for reform that reduces incarceration, they should avoid changes that will widen disparity as has happened with juvenile confinement and with women in state prisons. Now, here's a pie chart here, another pie chart. Incarceration is just one piece of the much larger system of incarceration control. The United States justice system controls almost 7 million people, more than half of, the, of whom are on probation. Look at that chart. Okay, here's another chart. Ratio and ethnic disparities in correctional facilities. Here's another chart. 64% blacks at 40% Latinos at 19% native people at 1% U S population. Here's the chart. Take a look at it for yourself. Whites are underrepresented in incarcerated populations while blacks are overrepresented. According to the data, once again, we're 40% of the of jail populations in this country we're third, but we're only 13% of the population. Now, I believe this is because, like I said earlier in the presentation, if you have priors, you're gonna, they're gonna put you in jail. And at the very early stages of youth, if you are a young black man, a black man, 
and you already have had run-ins with the criminal justice system when you were a youth, then you'll just get more and more time added to your sentence and you'll continue to be the easiest person to be convicted because they've been preying on us since the time that we were youth. That's why I brought up, I emphasize how much of our youth are being impacted by the criminal justice system. Because, you know, because uh, the industrial complex system, which is prison or jail, it's a money-making system. So they got to get you when you're young so that you keep going through that evolving door of the prison system. So this is very important stuff here to, to examine and look at. So here's a slide again. Here's another slide here. Women incarceration patterns are very different than men. So check that out. Local jails, 96,000. In the local jails, you have black women, black female. I mean, uh, you have, let me, no, no, let me correct that, what I just said. Not black women. Overall, women in prison overall in this country is at 69,000 for local jails. That's overall women, despite race. Jails and jail policies are especially important for women. Overall female youth at 4,600. Federal prison, you've got about 14,000 overall women in federal prisons. And at state level prisons, you've got 99,000 women overall in prison. So when I said black women at 96,000, that was incorrect. It's overall women in general in local jails at 96,000 in local jails. So let me move on to the next slide. And here you have here, women state prison populations have grown faster than men. Growth measures in terms of numbers of times greater than 1978 baseline population. There you go, women, it's going up, baby. Since, 2000, since 1978 to 2015, it's going up. Men, it's going downward to a certain degree. That's on that chart that you see there. Now, and with the big picture now, and I'm just trying to give you folks the big picture now. People are locked up in the United States where and why we are having better foundations for long overdue conversations. This is long overdue conversation about criminal justice reform for example data makes it clear that ending the war on drugs will not alone end mass incarceration but that federal government and some states have effectively reduced their incarceration populations by turning to drug policy reform looking at the whole picture it also opens up the conversation about where we should focus our energy to deal with these issues. What is the role of the federal government to end mass incarceration? The federal prison system is just a small slice of the total pie, but the federal government can contain, can, can, can contain and use its financial and ideological powers to incentivize and illuminate better paths forward in dealing with this criminal justice system. At the same time, how can sheriffs, elect, uh, electric, uh, uh, elected officials, sheriffs, and district attorneys and judges slow the flow of people into the criminal justice system? They're making money off of it. That's why they probably may not want to slow it down. Are states officials and prosecutors willing to rethink both the war on drugs and the policies that do not work that have served to increase both the odds of incarceration and the length of stay for violent offenses do policy makers and public have the focus to confront the second largest slice of some of the some of these statistics and pie charts that I put up, which is the thousands of locally administered jails. And does it even make sense to arrest millions of people each year for minor offenses, making them post money bail and then locking them up when they can't afford to pay it? Will our leaders be brave enough I don't think so <laughs> to redirect the correctional 
the, the correction spending to smarter investments like community-based drug treatment and job training. Can we implement reforms that both reduce the number of people incarcerated in the United States and the well-known racial and ethnic disparities in the criminal justice system? Now, we can see that something needs to change, folks. Something needs to change big time because when you look at the big picture, in reality, when you have up to, I mean, when you have people locked up to the tune of 2.3 million people on any given day, given this nation's issues around incarceration, having the highest incarceration rates in the world, America, I'm going to repeat, has the highest incarceration rates in the world. Both policymakers and, and the public have responsibility to carefully examine, consider each individual's situation from a social, economic, political. The info. It's the man with the info. Whatever you want to know, come join the man with the info show. It's the info. It's the man with the info. Whatever you want to know.